Oh, Facing a slide of me. Oh. Sure, that's on the floor. We already are. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good. Um, sorry for the technical issues, and I really appreciate your patience. I'm just pulling up my notes here. Um, as Cheryl said, I have been working uh, with uh, Extreme History for a long time, and um, it's just such a valuable resource in this community. So I have given a presentation here before. Um, on earlier part of my research, which was on Libby and Butte and Superfund, um, but it's transitioned somewhat, so I'm excited to share uh, what I came up with and how I finished my dissertation. Um, and then I'm definitely happy to open to any questions at the end um, that you may have. So let's get started. Um, so, in 1996, Richard White, who is a, a well-known historian of the American West, published an article in the Western Historical Court Quarterly magazine titled, The Current Weirdness in the West. And he concluded that fringe groups, sorry, can you all hear me? Okay. Fringe groups, um, extremist groups, such as the Aryan Nation and militia groups, um, were expressing long-standing Western anger against the federal government. Um, and so he sort of wrote a short article about how he saw that occurring in the West. So, quick question. Uh, how many of you lived in Montana in the 1980s and 1990s? Okay, a good number of you, so did I. Um, and so some of these might sound familiar to you, but just to do us quick, run through of some notable, notable events that were occurring in Montana and around the region. So, oh, sorry, we have um, Dan and Don Nichols in 1984, who were self-proclaimed mountain men who kidnapped a uh, Olympic bi or US uh, biathlete by the name of Carrie Swenson. Um, they were father and son, and the goal was to make her a bride of the son. And um, in the resulting sort of abduction and rescue attempt, she was shot in the chest, and one of the rescuers um, was killed. And then the Nichols went on a five-month sort of um, hiding in the mountains of southwest Montana before they were caught. 1988, we had extreme fires in Yellowstone, Montana. That might sound pretty uh, standard for these days, not this summer, but these days. But in 19, 1988, it was um, extreme to the point that 30% of Yellowstone National Park burned in the fires, and the federal government was um, roundly criticized for longstanding <coughs> fire policy that they had um, subscribed to. In 1990, the Church Universal Triumphant, also known as CUT, um, had um, moved outside of Livingston in Paradise Valley, and the prophet at the time, whose name was Elizabeth Clare Prophet, said that a nuclear uh, war was going to occur on March 15th in 1990. So um, hundreds, if not um, thousands, of Church Universal Triumphant members from around the nation moved to Livingston, Bozeman, the surrounding area, to be here for the end of the world. Um, the, uh, the, arm, the nuclear war would happen, and the water would rise up until basically the Bridger Mountains, and then that area would be sort of new Oceanside property. People in Bozeman had end of the world parties during that time period, um, and it did not occur, but that was quite um, an event that happened in the area. area. A little further away on Idaho, Idaho and Montana border, we had Ruby Ridge, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. We had Waco very soon after that in Texas. In 1995, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols bombed the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building um, in Oklahoma City, killing 168 people. In 1996, um, the federal 55 mile per hour speed limit was um, eliminated by Congress, and Montana returned back to its earlier speed limit, um, which was reasonable and prudent. For, um, from 1996 until 1999, um, the state was referred to as having the Montana bond because people were driving 
at what they determined was a reasonable and prudent speed. Uh, 1996, we'll talk about the Jordan Freeman, but they had their standoff with the federal government for 81 days. So there was a lot occurring here, and then as the FBI agents were dealing with the Jordan Freeman, they also um, discovered and captured the Unabomber in Lincoln, Montana. So there was a lot occurring around the um, region and the state, as I was saying, and these sort of things were what Richard White was discussing when he uh, referred to the weirdness in the West. So, I remember these events too. I was growing up here. I also remember in Bozeman that you'd see, the, you'd see homemade cardboard license plates um, around town, and they were indicative of people who were um, citizens who had decided to reject the federal and, state, federal and state authority and make their own license plates. So I remember seeing those as well as a child. So, um, the questions that I wanted to look at when I thought about this extreme, extremism in Montana was, were Montanans just extra crazy? <laughs> just crazy people? Or did they share an anger which could um, extend into violence with other Western residents directed at the federal government, environmentalists, academics, and other groups who they believed were at best ignoring rural concerns or at worst threatening their liberty and their lives? And so the question I asked was, why did Montana see, a, among other Western states, but why did Montana see a rise of anti-government activity in the 1980s and 1990s? I looked at three Montana communities and how they responded um, to state and federal government regulation at this time to answer that question. And my dissertation, in my dissertation, I argued that the study of these rural communities reveal the continuum of responses to federal regulation, ranging from frustrated res resignation to armed rebellion to desperate pleas for assistant assistance. These responses from communities, um, as I said, who had best viewed the federal government with suspicion, explained how anti-government anger grew in the West and gave insight into the endurance of this anger. So that's where I came to at the end, but I want to stop, walk through the communities I looked at, and what I was exploring in my research. To set the stage, or the context for what we're looking at in Montana, there is a long history of sort of um, friction between Westerners and the government, the federal government that I'm not gonna go into today. Historians theorize that it might be because so much of the land in the West is owned by the federal government or managed by the federal government. Um, it could, they've also theorized that it's because so many resources were taken out of the West in the early days that um, the, uh, the citizens had, didn't, had little faith in the federal government. There's been a lot of theories as to why, but what we see when we hit the 1980s and 1990s is um, a real drastic increase of the anger, um, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so part of that is tied to the environmental movement and the reaction to the environmental movement, which, um, you know, the first environmental EPA, um, environmental act, sorry, and EPA come out of the 70s and 80s, so there's reaction to decisions made by the federal government in these areas. Um, and also, um, as the economy dwindled in any, many places in the American West, um, that led to a lot of frustration by citizens as they had seen that they had given their um, work and their resources to building America through most of the 20th century. Now they saw dwindling incomes and returns on that. And so it, we saw a pairing at this time period of Western anger incorporating far right extremism um, coming together. We saw a real growth in anti-government groups which included militias and sovereign citizens, which I will talk about white supremacy groups such as the Aryan Nation and Christian nationalism um, really sort of started to grow in a new way and connect with each other in a new way. As I said, the environmental policies of the time, um, Endangered Species Act and the EPA's environmental policies came under, um, were roundly criticized by many Westerners during this time. Um, the declining resource economies and the rise of right-wing conservative media talk radio, and early internet presence in the mid-1990s. And a lot of these far-right extremist groups really capitalized on the internet very early on um, 
in, in as soon as it was um, really sort of uh, disseminated, people were in the those groups were really using it to communicate with each other. I said I was going to talk a little about Ruby Ridge and Waco. The reason why I want to talk about them is because they become galvanizing features of the far right movement. So if you're unfamiliar, Ruby Ridge happened in August 1992. There was an 11-day um, armed standoff between uh, Randy Weavers and his family and the federal government. Um, in the midst of this um, sort of, it had actually been an 18-month sort of standoff. He had been um, accused of trafficking in, in illegal weapons, and um, he made threats, and so there's this long standing. But it comes down to 11 days, and during that time period, Randy Weaver's wife, Vicki, and his son were shot, as well as a U.S. Marshal. Mm -hmm. um, so a tragic end to that. Then the Weaver, uh, rest of the Weaver family and some family friends um, then surrender at that point. Very soon after that, uh, the Branch Davidian um, <coughs> cult in uh, Waco, Texas, has a sort of same arm standoff with the federal government. The FBI agents are involved again, and they storm in um, using tear gas, and there are many um, sort of conflicting reports of what happened, but the compound catches on fire, you can see that on the top, and 82 cult members were killed, including 20, 20 children. And these become both indicative to a lot of the far right, uh, those involved in the far right, of government um, overreach and government tyranny. There's federal um, hearings on this in the Senate, and both the FBI in both cases was um, was found to be overstepping its. Um, sort of the, its role and scope in those measures. So that becomes a long lasting legacy for the far right that uh, the government is going to come for you and it's going to kill you. So these become uh, the sort of touch points for many in the far right. And you can see here, um, there would be protesters even while um, Waco and Ruby Ridge were going on, this uh, standoffs, and then afterwards uh, really sort of became this vivid touch point for many um, to say that the, uh, the only resistance against the federal government that you can have is armed resistance. You need to defend yourself from the federal government. So let's move from there and look at the communities that I looked at in Montana. And you can see the blue stars there. <coughs> Up in the far western, northwestern corner of the state is Libby, Montana. In the central um, part of the state, central Montana is Denton. And in the eastern Montana is Jordan. And these communities share some similarities besides all being in Montana. They're all smaller rural communities, a couple hundred residents to a few thousand. Um, they're very remote. Um, they're all off sort of major interstate interstates. That's an hour, one and a half hours to three hours to the nearest city. So they're very remote places in the West. They are based in rural, uh, sorry, resource economies. So agriculture, mining, and logging. And as I said, we see declines in all of those areas um, in the 1970s and 1980s in Montana and many parts of the West. And so there's a lot of frustration and a lot of anger in these communities. And um, at this time period, you saw throughout the rural West People uh, who were angry and frustrated wanted to figure out who was to blame and who to target. And in many cases, it was the federal government. And I'm going to briefly talk about each of these communities to give you an idea of what their thoughts on that and how they interacted with the federal government. So we'll start first with Denton. So have anyone been to Denton before? Okay, great. You guys know where it is. So Central Montana, really based uh, agricultural economy, founded in 1915. Um, in two, 2020, the census had 205 residents. Um, at its peak in 1950, it was about 450 residents. Um, and so they've seen um, drastic decline in their community. They're afraid about losing their high school. Um, there's lots, very few businesses left in the town. And um, I went there to interview people about their experiences with a, um, two large water infrastructure projects 
in their community, one in 1988 and one in 2016. And they have been dealing with water issues um, for decades in Denton. And the new storage tank that you can see here overlooks the town. That one was built, it took four years to build and cost $2.5 million, which is an extensive project for a town with just over 200 residents in it. What I want to focus on is the earlier um, water project in 1988, which um, was less expensive. It cost about $750,000, but it required a new water source from the well to meet EPA nitrate standards. And so the EPA uh, monitors nitrate standards because um, high nitrates in water can be very, very bad for uh, particularly infants and young children. And infants can get something called blue baby disease where the nitrate um, enters their system and pairs with oxygen and they can't get oxygen into their blood and they turn blue and that can lead to a coma and death. <coughs> so across the nation, the EPA and in Montana, the Montana DEQ as well, the Department of Environmental Quality monitor nitrates for those concerns. And so um, the DEQ came in, the EPA and the DEQ came into Denton in 1988 and said, you've got to get this new water system. And residents re responded in a variety of different ways. Um, and there were really four main areas when I did interviews there, and I interviewed mayors and former mayors and current mayors, former um, uh, council members, um, longtime residents, and these are sort of the shared areas of frustration. Generally, they didn't believe that nitrates were a problem. There were a lot of them who said, we have the oldest citizens in the world here. We drank this water our whole lives, and we've never had a blue baby here. So they were very, um, distrustful of the science and government regulation. Um, they also believed that the government requirements to meet uh, nitrate regulation were um, ridiculous, to say the least. They found them that you had to do repeated testing to meet the nitrate requirements, which cost the community a lot of money. And then on top of that, to build a new water system they thought was um, burdensome to the community. Um, and they were concerned with that financial burden, especially as they were losing um, population in the area. The testing itself, um, to test for contaminants in water, uh, the EPA requires that communities test for 90 different contaminants, and it's very expensive and time consuming. And then generally, the things that they were wor worried about in Denton, um, declining up population, not having enough students for the schools, jobs leaving, were not addressed by a new water system. They did not believe that a new water system was going to improve um, residents, the experience of people in Denton. Um, Oliver is one of the people I interviewed, and when I interviewed under the requirements of the interview um, program, I kept everyone anonymous. So that's a picture of Oliver up there. Um, I was just like, yeah. And so I interviewed, he's one of the people I interviewed in the town, and I think he really, some of his answers really exemplify this frustration that they felt towards the government towards these nitrate requirements. And so one thing that he said that was echoed by many people is there's a long history of, uh, with nitrates. Even back in the 60s, they, the residents of Denton, knew that it was high in nitrates, but it's never, uh, there's never been any negative health results. So he shared that with a lot of residents. Um, he also said that nitrates overall aren't an issue. Um, the spring water is wonderful. You could wash your pickup and it wouldn't spot. It was very nice water. So he was very suspicious of the need to um, put in a new water system just to reduce nitrate levels. Again, he also talked about the burden of testing. Some of these tests were pretty darn expensive. I just didn't get in a hurry. I was kind of like, leave me alone. So I was kind of dragging my feet, to be honest. So he and other people would talk about how they would get these warnings from the DEQ to put it to um, address the nitrates, and they'd throw the letters in the trash. They wouldn't respond to them. Their general philosophy was just avoid, and um, the government will leave us alone, which is not what happened, because then the um, EPA sent them a letter saying they were going to fine them thousands of dollars a day if they didn't fix this nitrate problem. And his response was, um, 
basically I learned how I could assuage them and not totally cave to them, so he was doing this balancing act, um, and work the system. We were friendly with um, the Montana DEQ, and then it wasn't. All of a sudden, boom, certified mail, and it was a threat that, there's a threat of fines and all this and that, and possible jail sentences could result from this. And I said, you son of a bitch, I'm calling you right now. So that certainly got his attention when it progressed to that point, but he and Minnie and uh, Denton had decided to just not address the situation until they had to. And then when they did, they weren't um, particularly happy with the cost and um, uh, sort of regulation that they were required to meet. So, as I said, the way I define Denton is they dealt with frustrated resignation. They didn't find that the regulations were helpful to them. They found them frustrating and burdensome. Um, they felt adversarial with the government, with both state and federal government. However, in the end, they did work with the state and federal, or state and federal government officials to meet the regulations. So um, even with that frustrated, frustration, they were resigned to still having to improve their water system. We did not see that kind of resignation in Jordan, which will sound familiar to some of you. I was founded in 1909, predominantly agriculture there. Um, very, as I said, very distant um, from any sort of urban infrastructure. There's no railroad, li railroad line that goes through the county. Um, the two state highways there are among the least traveled in the state. Um, and in 1980s, a lot of farms and ranches were hit with agri the agricultural crisis. Um, some of the people who had labored joined the Freeman lost their ranches in that, um, in that time period. They also have seen a decline. They had 350 residents in 2020. Um, Mid-century, they had about 550. So they had seen quite the decline. Um, and Gallatin, I'm sorry, Gallatin, Garfield County, the current county they're in, uh, which is over 1,200 residents, is one of the least populated counties in the state. They draw, they're best known for um, their dinosaur fossils that they have off the Hell Creek Fountain Formation and the Freeman standoff, at least in the 1990s. So the Freeman um, are an interesting bunch. If I had all might, I could talk to you about the Freeman. But basically, um, they fed off of far right conspiracy theories, anti government anger, and their own interpretations of the Bible, Constitution, Bill of Rights, and Magna Carta. It was a small group. It was less than 20 freemen who seceded from, quote unquote, seceded from the United States and created their own government, court system, and currency on a ranch outside of Jordan. Um, through a variety, uh, the federal government had been watching them for a while. They had learned lessons from Waco and Jordan. They made the conscious decision not to just go in and sort of end the standoff, um, guns drawn, but they decided to engage with the people there um, and try and negotiate a release, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, end a surrender to the um, siege. And so they had an 81 day standoff with the FBI and it was ended peacefully and they surrendered. Um, the leaders of that, which is about 13, were found guilty of more than 500 charges um, in uh, federal court after that in Billings. <coughs> so that's a sum up of the Freeman. You can see their compound there. There's the FBI coming in. Um, I don't want to address them today because they really actually did not present, represent most people in Jordan. They were not, um, the, most people in Jordan were pretty unhappy that the Freeman were there causing all of this trouble. But what I do want to focus on is um, Miss Janet Guptill here who ran the local newspaper because I think her um, running of this newspaper and the editorials and letters that she published in it really do represent a wider view of the anger that you saw in Jordan, uh, Montana. So she had the Jordan Tribune, the local newspaper, and it really just ran mostly the 1990s. It ran into the early 2000s. Um, she passed away just a year or two ago, I think last year actually. But during the 1990s, during this time period, there were repeated sort of refrains of what people were upset about um, in Jordan who were writing to the paper. And her editorials and her son's editorials also reflect this. Very targeted areas. They were very angry at uh, the EPA and Endangered Species Act, they saw the loss of jobs and that meant for people on um, agriculture and mining and timber industries. 
That tied into the spotted owl controversy, which was happening in the Pacific Northwest, um, where the EPA decided to, or the Endangered Spotted Owl was put on the Endangered Species Act and closed off a lot of um, logging in some old growth areas. They were also very focused on the reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone National Park, which happened in 1996. Um, there was a lot of fear about wolves coming to Jordan from Yellowstone Park. Um, there were farming and ranching challenges that they were upset about. They were very concerned about government tyranny and the oppression of American citizens. And they really got caught up in this idea of um, one world government and other conspiracy theories. Um, and the targeted sort of, um, the, peop the groups that they targeted at this time period that they saw were causing all of this were the federal government, environmentalists, academics, and urban residents who didn't understand what it was like to live in rural Montana. So that's the um, headline for the Jordan Tribune there. And it actually, um, for a small town paper, was pretty well circulated. It circulated in 13 counties in eastern Montana. And it had a surprisingly diverse geographic readership. Um, letters came as far away as New Mexico and Wyoming were writing in and reading this. Um, so, as I said, during this time period, both the letters to the or letters and the editorials that Janet um, was writing and her son Scott was was writing were very targeted. The sort of refrains you would hear would be environmentalists care more for flora and fauna than jobs and people. There's a fear of environmentalists growing more extreme over the decade. One editorial warned that environmentalists would do more than take their jobs, quote, it must be noted that Hitler's plan of genocide was child's play compared to what these eco-freaks have in store for us. Hitler only killed millions. Environmentalists want to kill billions. So that was an editorial in the paper by Janet. Wolf reintroduction, as I said, there's a lot of fears about wolves. Um, sort of coming out of Yellowstone Park and going into other areas of Montana. Um, a lot of fear, although most Americans generally supported wolf reintroduction according to polls. Um, the editorials and letters in the paper railed against that decision. One letter bordered on hysteria warning that, quote, predator lovers, or warning predator lovers, that they would die a slow, painful death once wolves, quote, wolves, quote, start eating on your internals. So, Lots of thoughts about how you couldn't let your children outside because the wolves would get them in Jordan, um, which is a distance from Yellowstone National Park. Uh, there's also fears of new world order and one world government, as I said, filling the papers. Warnings that adoption of the metric system would lead to the downfall of America. Another writer asked, um, are we becoming sufficiently brainwashed to accept a one world government? And then that also tied into the idea that the government would willingly and eagerly trample your rights and use Gestapo uh, tactics to do so. Quote, if you want to be free, then you should make up your mind that you will, you very well may be forced to take up weapons and um, take your stand. To those timid so souls who will not stand with us, I say to you, go and cower before your masters, the government. You are not my countrymen. If we lose a battle, then your own children will um, come to you as the chains of tyrants are placed upon them. So sort of that echoing that, those phrases. Um, when Gupto did receive feedback um, that some, a few readers were critical of her, um, but most people wrote in and say, thank you for saying what hasn't been said, what needs to be said. Um, and so she often encouraged people to come in, that she had a library in the office of the newspaper where they could check out videos and read pamphlets on the one world government concerns. Um, so where I see this happening, and I think this is really interesting, is this local paper created sort of an echo chamber, uh, much like we see in social media today, that reinforced common complaints among Westerners um, in Eastern Montana and amplified them through conspiracy theories and fears of a tyrannical government. She really tried to start, straddle a line between saying, um, I'm just uh, publishing all this in her newspapers and having editorials on this, but then saying, I'm just getting the facts readers can make their own decisions. This really backfired for her, however, because when the Freemen <clears throat> really ramped up their activities and became a target of the federal government, they thanked her for um, being, quote, uh, 
They announced that she was of Freeman character and had unfailingly published our truths in the local newspaper. And at that point, she quickly backed down and um, denied any association, said I was just telling facts. So um, she sort of got her hand slapped uh, as she had been supporting a lot of the rhetoric of the Freeman and had been publishing many of their letters. Uh, when they, the FBI came in, she sort of toned things down at that point. But, and many others in, as I said in Jordan, denounced these sort of extremist positions as well too, and these conspiracy theories. However, I do think the newspaper, um, what's being shown in the newspaper at that time period really does represent a lot of general fears that Westerners had about the government and others at that point. So, let's move on to Libby, which is my last spot in northwestern Montana. Um, it has been uh, mainly, mainly logging and mining resources there. Uh, Mid-century, they had among the highest wages in the state in Lincoln County there. At the end of the 20th century, logging and mining were both in decline, and in the early 1980s, local unemployment in Libby hit a high of 37%. So there's a lot of stress in the um, 80s and 90s about jobs being lost and what the future of the community look like, would look like. Against the backdrop of this sort of um, declining population and high unemployment, two brothers from Libby, the Orr brothers, Scott and DC, decide to hold a rally to protest a regulatory control exerted by the federal government. They organize a massive anti-government war on the West rally. Um, Scott was actually a Libby business owner and outgoing member of the Montana House of Representatives. And they said that they were frustrated um, they wanted to protest federal control over gun owners, loggers, miners, snowmobilers, ranchers, off-road vehicle users, and others who were faced with changing land use policies on American national forests. They blamed the federal government and agencies for that, and they're really looking at sort of the Kootenai National Forest up in northwestern Montana that they felt like they were being um, kept from being able to recreate in or work in. So they planned this um, event on April 15th, tax day, um, that's not a coincidence, and they decided to have a parade and demonstrations um, against the federal government and the UN by burning federal tax forms and the UN flag. Um, they plan, they expect 3,000 frustrated citizens to show up, and um, one local resident writes into the paper and says that um, He's also furious about getting the census in the mail. He sees it as President Clinton's goal to enforce socialism. And he plans to join the protest to, quote, prevent being led into serfdom by the sociopath that my neighbors put into the Oval Office. And so, um, again, sort of the shared anger and fear of the federal government. Against this backdrop, however, the Orr brothers are being encouraged strongly by community members to not hold this rally. And um, there's a specific reason why they're being asked not to hold the rally. And they do eventually cancel the rally. They, um, Scott Orr says that it's because the media um, makes up lies about how there will be violence there. But there's a lot of pressure from others in the community not to hold this rally. And it's because the year before, national news broke that um, people in Libby had been exposed for decades, for most of the 20th century, to asbestos that was uh, mixed in the local vermiculite mine, it was a local mineral line, mine, and as they were mining it and then bringing it to the community and processing it, they were releasing asbestos. And this article breaks in a Seattle newspaper in 1999 saying um, it has blanketed the um, town, it's blanketed the homes and the um, lungs of Libby residents. And at that point, hundreds had been Hundreds had died from lung-related disease, and thousand more were, were expected to die from it. In fact, the EPA had recently arrived in Libby right before the planned rally to investigate the contamination, and they declared Libby the worst case of industrial poisoning of an entire community in American history, declared a public health emergency, and started assessing the situation. So at that same time, the, uh, many in Libby are recognizing that they're gonna need some sort of help to this um, awful disaster they're experiencing, the Orr brothers decide we want to hold the rally to protest the federal government. So that's why they were asked to back down from holding that. And you can see here, that's the vermiculite mine, six miles outside of Libby, where many, many people worked. 
and dug this out of the ground. And any time it was sort of crushed, it was releasing asbestos, zoned by W.R. Grace from 1963 on. And this is the processing plant in downtown Libby. As a matter of fact, you can see here um, that um, the processing mill was right next to the um, baseball field. And they would um, take out all the tailings that they wouldn't use. It was had asbestos in it as well. And they would give it to people in town. So they were using it on the high school um, football field, on the track, on people would take it home in their gardens, the baseball field. So it had spread really throughout the community. And um, there were a lot of concerns about what that meant for um, community members. Because vermiculite is shaped, or sorry, asbestos from this vermiculite is shaped like little arrows and it goes into your lungs and causes um, lung-related diseases and cancers like mesothelioma, which you might have seen on ads um, in television, and it um, can also lead to other lung cancers and lung disease. So this is why the Orr brothers were pressured um, not to hold the rally and eventually did back down. And <coughs> then the EPA did come into Libby and make it a super fun site in 2002. So um, Libby becomes my sort of example of desperation, needing the federal government. You may be very angry at the federal government and they want to hold a rally against it, but when you find out your town is uh, contaminated by asbestos, the federal government is really the only entity that can help you through this process. So um, there were many other anti-government activities going on in the state at this time. I picked those three communities. Um, you also saw in Knox in Montana, the Mo Militia of Montana, or MOM as it was called, um, which was founded by John Trockman in February 1994. It became the nation's best known and most prolific distributor of anti-government propaganda. They mailed out thousands of manuals detailing how to form your own militias, and at its peak it claimed half a million followers. So um, that was going on in, and they, and um, Trockman was also involved in Jordan and the Freemen, but that was going on in Knoxon, which is in the western part. You also had white supremacists in Northwest Montana who were loosely associated with the Aryan Nation in Northern Idaho. In Superior, white nationalists invited armed supporters from around the nation to gather in town and show their support for creating an all-white nation where the, when the whole rest of the nation is teeming with mongrels and misfits. In Billings, White nationalists posted anti-Semitic flyers and made bomb threats against the synagogue um, and target, also targeted homosexuals and Native Americans. In 1994, a national report um, concluded that Montana had 20 identified white supremacy groups. Uh, you also had sovereigns and constitutionalists that I talked about at the beginning who um, didn't believe that the government had authority over them. They wouldn't pay taxes. They would have armed standoffs, um, smaller ones as well, with the federal government. Um, in 1993, 20 constitutionalists um, put a notice in the Rivali paper in Bitterroot Valley saying that they were seceding from the federal government and no, would no longer be responsible for any debt that they owed the government. Um, in 1995, outside of the Hamilton Courthouse, um, the Constitutionalists um, got mad when a woman was arrested who was part of the group and they drove around the courthouse for two days um, waving guns out of their car windows and the county had to put a 90-day um, emergency order that no weapons were allowed near the courthouse. So there's a lot, and that's just a few of the events going on, there's a lot of tension and anger building in the state. Um, it's not all extremists though, there are people who are fighting back um, against this rising tide of extremism. The Montana Human Rights Network, you can see up there, was founded in 1990 in response to the growing militia movements and white national, um, nationalist activity in the state. And they often reported in the paper and to federal agencies on far right organizations in the state. Um, in 1995, Rivali um, County residents put an uh, announcement in the paper expressing support when um, they were being threatened by nationalists in town, I'm sorry, by constitutionalists, and they expressed, quote, that proclamation, um, support for our local, state, and nationally elected officials and public employees in their endeavors to do their respective duties. They had hundreds of signatures for that, and they said, 
We abhor and speak out against threats of violence by any persons or organizations against these public servants. Um, the Bitterroot Human right, Rights Alliance sponsored a community unity day after the courthouse confrontations. Um, billing residents joined together. Um, down here you can see they formed an organization to stand up to hate from the white supremacists called Not In Our Town. It included religious and community leaders, labor union volunteers, law enforcement, and um, the local newspaper and concerned citizens that supported those who were being attacked by white supremacists um, through flyers and through rhetoric. The Not In Our Town organization launched after a PBS film documented the effects of the efforts of Billings residents to fight against hate in 1995. And that's still a organization that you can find online, national organization now. So there were people who were aware that things were occurring, um, heading towards anti-government extremism, who decided to push back against it. So that gives you an idea of what was happening in the 1990s. I do want to talk about where these some of the communities I looked at are today, because I think it's important to see that in some cases um, the situation has not gotten a lot better economically or um, population-wise for them. Denton, you might have heard about, if you were unaware of Denton before, you might have heard about because in December 2021, a wildfire went through central Montana and destroyed 26 homes and the landmark 100-year-old grain elevators there. Very surprisingly, no lives were lost, but the mayor reported that at least eight residents had lost their homes. Um, that's a substantial number when the town had over 200 residents. So again, um, they are really struggling in Denton. Um, the community is very dedicated to helping the community survive, but they are up against a lot there. Libby, um, by 2022, most of Libby and the surrounding area had been removed from Superfund, um, the cleanup area of the EPA. The cleanup had cost more than $600 million, and medical screenings have documented at least 2,400 people who have asbestos-related illnesses and more than 400 deaths related to um, asbestos exposure. <coughs> Interestingly, the Orr brothers, the gentlemen who planned the anti-government rally in 2000, crop up back in the newspapers um, in uh, 2020 and 2021 as very outspoken critics of COVID-19 pandemic um, sort of restrictions and really protest, again, government tyranny and encourage residents to attend community meetings armed to protest against that. And in Jordan, you can see there, they also had a wildfire in 2020. As a while, or they were evacuated as a wildfire threatened their community, but it skirted the town, so the town was saved. Um, they really haven't shown up much in the newspapers, much like Denton, um, except for the fire, until anniversaries of the Freeman standoff. And so reporters descend on the town and want to talk to residents who do not want to talk about the Freeman standoff. Um, they're not very happy to see that. Um, but to sort of see where we've come in the, since the 1980s and 1990s in these communities, and I would argue in many places in the West, is the anger that they felt in the 80s and 90s hasn't really been diminished. And in some cases has been amplified, as I said, through social media, through um, the rise of um, sort of far right media, through um, being able to connect more easily through the internet. And so you're seeing sort of this change um, or these attitudes persisting. This gentleman here is, I want to get this right, Rodney Skirdal, who is one of the Freemen, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, and he got out generally right before 2020, and I don't know if you can read his hat there, but it says, Montana Freeman, uh, where we failed, Trump will succeed. Mm. So still very, very angry at the federal government. There's been very few um, residents, uh, sorry, uh, Jordan Freeman, who have back down from their earlier statements about that. So um, I think that uh, it's interesting to tie these extremist movements into that long-standing anger um, in Western communities. Um, as I've shown here, I think in the 1980s and 1990s, we saw this peak of sort of anger and um, sort of anti-government attention focused in these communities. 
And then um, for a variety of different reasons, including uh, the government coming in for some of these standoffs and um, those groups who fight back against anti-government extremism and white supremacy, things calm but do not disappear. When I read what was going on during the pandemic with far right movements and how they were um, angry at the federal government, the exact same rhetoric, rhetoric was being used if you saw in the 80s and 90s. It did not disappear during that time period. So that's where I'd like to finish today and thank um, all my supporters as well as of course Extreme History having me here today. So, uh, again, thank you for your patience with the difficulties at first, but can I take any questions or does anyone have any responses?